Hey, well, good evening. It's uh, great to see you all here tonight. We're uh, going to take a couple minutes to let everybody sort of log on and get, get situated and, and uh, be where they're supposed to be. And I pray that uh, tonight as, as we uh, begin this uh, service, we're going to call it a service, it's, it's where God has us right now. Um, it's where uh, the gospel is going forth. You know, it's not a that's not a church and a pulpit, and you're sitting in pews where I'm sitting behind a, in front of a computer and and uh, with my uh, tallit behind me, and and um, I'm just uh, look forward to what God has to us tonight for us tonight. And um, uh, let's see, my my brother Mike's on. Uh, but you didn't know Mike's middle name was Emery, did you? Uh, and I'm sure he'll tell you all what my middle name is. But um, just look forward to to um, seeing you all tonight, Juwan and, and Hannah. Hi, Hannah. I hope you're having a good week. Uh, it's been an interesting week, hasn't it, with the, with the weather and all the news and everything that's going on. It's like after a while, you, you don't even want to watch the news. You, even the... Um, the stuff on Yahoo and uh, the, the uh, interesting things we get on Facebook now, isn't it? It's just um, it's just been interesting. Uh, some of it frustrating, amen. Some of it's frustrating and confusing at times, isn't it? But uh, you know, if we wouldn't know that God has a plan, I'm not saying that the devil caused this or the. Or, I mean, God didn't surely didn't cause this. I'm sure the devil has his hand in it, uh, as he does everything. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. But uh, God uh, knows. Yeah, he's the God who sees. He knows and sees down the road. Amen. He knows what our, his plan is for us, for this country. Uh, we know that he is greater, amen, than this uh, virus. He's greater than uh, anything that the uh, the devil can throw at us. Amen, Jeff. Uh I hope you're uh, all cuddled up with uh, butters tonight and and uh, ready to have your Bible open. I encourage you to to have your Bible open. Although we're only going to go to a, you're only going to have to turn to two scriptures tonight. Uh, the first one is in First uh, uh, Corinthians chapter two and three, and the other one is in Hebrews chapter five. So if you want to uh, mark Hebrews chapter five, we're going to be starting in. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, we're going to continue uh, this study we've been looking at for, uh, this will be part 6 of this series, believe it or not, uh, it wasn't my plan to go this long, uh, my plan was to do two weeks and, and that would be it, but uh, I believe God um, has spoken to us uh, through this um, this look into his word and uh, tonight and we'll probably end up on Sunday. We'll finalize everything on Sunday. We'll try to wrap this up. But but how many of you know that uh, we as we are raised to new life in Christ, uh, there's so much, isn't it? So much to learn, so much to grow in, so much to learn how to walk in our new life. Uh, because we started, you know, uh, several weeks ago. I don't even know how long ago. We started in um, Ephesians chapter 2, read verses 1 through 7, and we looked at particularly verses 4 and 5 that says, He made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We started there and we looked uh, a little bit at about those three togethers in those, first, in those two verses, uh, together in his resurrection, in his ascension, and in his present rule at God's right hand. Uh, because we are part of his rule and reign here on earth. Uh, we are, we looked at, we are his ambassadors. Amen. And we have to learn uh, how to be an ambassador. We have to learn the, the, the laws of the, of the land and have to learn the laws of the word and uh, what the word says to us and what belongs to us in Christ as our new life. And so we looked at that. We looked at Romans chapter 6 uh, because it says because we are raised to new life, we have to learn to walk 
in newness of life, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6. Uh, and as new creations, amen, we're new creations in Christ, uh, we have to learn how to walk as new creations. It's almost like a, almost like a baby has to learn to walk. Amen. Uh, I'm sure if you, when you were born again, you didn't uh, uh, automatically uh, walk as a mature Christian. You know, to be honest, uh, some of us took years and years to uh, learn uh, the ways of God and, and the things of Christ and how to walk as a, as a Christian should walk. Amen. Um, as a mature Christian, uh, maybe look a little bit at that tonight. Being a mature Christian. What's it mean to be a mature Christian? So we're going to look at a little bit at that tonight. Uh, we found uh, we found identity box as we built on the foundation of Christ in Ephesians chapter one. We learned that we were blessed, we're chosen, we're adopted, we're redeemed. Uh, so many things that we can glean out of uh, Ephesians chapter one. Amen. It's and we just, believe me, we just uh, touch the surface. Amen. I heard somebody today talk about Ephesians chapter 4. And like, man, that is so good. If you learn uh, what Paul is, is trying to tell uh, the church at Ephesus, um, if we learn to walk that way and talk that way and live that way, you know, we'll just, uh, we will be uh, uh, peculiar people because we won't be acting like the world acts. Amen? Uh, we want to get into that tonight. But Ephesians chapter 5, real quick, we looked at uh, uh, three ways to walk in this new life. Amen? We learned we had to deal with the flesh. We have to be imitators of God, the Bible says, Ephesians 5.1. We have to be imitators of God. We have to, to, to walk in love as Christ is. We have to learn, um, really, to make the choice. Amen. To walk in love. And isn't that a lot of times? Amen. That's a lot of times a tough choice. But uh, the Bible says we have to learn to walk in love. Uh, love never fails. You know, the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, we need to learn that. So uh, we learn that. We need to deal with our flesh. Amen. We, we have to, as Christians, we have to crucify our flesh, uh, the Bible says, and uh, deal with the fleshly things of, of darkness that we used to walk in. Amen. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 tells us uh, where we used to be, where we used to traffic in and walk in. Uh, but we don't walk there anymore, I hope. Uh, at least I hope you don't walk there anymore. Um, but uh, we have to learn how to walk this way. Um, uh, that's an old song, isn't it, Jeff? Uh, who sang that? ZZ Top, wasn't it, Jeff? It was walk this way. Uh, you can probably sing that better than I can. But anyhow... Um, and we have to ask ourselves, uh, why doesn't everyone receive the things of God? Why doesn't everyone receive the things of the Spirit? Um, and we looked at that last week, didn't we, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? We looked at that, how we receive, amen, we receive from the Spirit of God, don't we? We receive from, yes, the Word of God and from good preaching, good teaching, uh, we should, uh, but we we have to know what God wants to give us. He says, God has revealed them to us through his spirit. So we have the spirit of God that, that is a major, major factor in our lives, or at least he should be. The Holy Spirit should be a major factor in our life. God, Jesus said, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. He said, I'm going so the Holy Spirit can come. And the Holy Spirit's coming was to, to make sure uh, that, that the things that Jesus did was continued here on this earth. You know, he wasn't coming to set up his own kingdom. He wasn't coming to do something different. The Holy Spirit came that we could, through his anointing, through his power and authority, you know, walk in the, in the ways that Jesus walked. Do the things that Jesus did. Isn't that what uh, Luke tries to tell us in Acts chapter 1? What Jesus came to do, what work to do, work to continue in the things that Jesus came to do. So the Holy Spirit is a, is a major, major part of our life. And we're going to take next week or Sunday morning, just take a small 
snippet of, of what the Holy Spirit's interaction in our life is supposed to be like. Amen. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Pastor Rob will be here. Uh, Sunday morning, I'll be back. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, Dr. Pegg will be here. And uh, next week, we'll be here Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. And you know, I just have to stop. It amazes me uh, how many people um, join in every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. There's, there's a lot of people, even people that uh, that don't come to our church, uh, join in. Join in every, uh, not every time, but but uh, but you know they 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 look at us and they 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 I'm sure they're they're evaluating us, amen. They're evaluating what well what do these people actually believe? Well, uh, if you know us, we believe in the gospel. You know, we believe in Jesus. You know, we believe in his resurrection, his or his death, his his burial, his resurrection, and. You know, we believe in the Holy Spirit. You know, we believe in the anointing and baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in, in uh, the, 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 the resurrection of the dead. We believe that, that we are resurrected to new life. And, amen, that's what this is all about, that we're, we're to live this new life. Amen. But the Holy Spirit, we looked at that last week. And, you know, if, if anything, last week was, was so important. I believe it was so important. If you reread uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 13, you know, and get a fresh revelation. Get a fresh revelation of, of how God wants to speak to us. And he wants, he desires to speak to his sheep. And he does that through, 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 through a still small voice, through, through the inner witness of the Spirit in us, you know, um, uh, I hear people say, well, well, God doesn't speak to me. Well, if you read his word, that's, his, that's God speaking to us. Amen. And that spirit that lives inside of us, you know, confirms the word in us. And, and it's so important. It's so important to read the word and allow the word to speak to us. Amen. It's just not a, another good book that we or a novel or about somebody's life or whatever. It, it's it's God's love letter, if you want to say it. it's God's letter to us. It's God's letter to us. It's it's how He uh, what's it the the B I B L E. It's basic instructions before leaving Earth. It's it's God's instruction manual to us. Amen. And it's also God's word to us, what we have to look forward to. Amen? We look forward to a, a glorious eternity in heaven. And when heaven comes down to earth and that whole, that whole thing there, it's a whole other sermon. But, but uh, you know, this, this word is so exciting. It's alive. Amen? It's, it's not dead. It's alive. This word's alive. And when, it's, when the word speaks to us, it causes us to become alive. It causes us to become somebody that we weren't before, uh, because we are, Amen. We are new creations in Christ. You know, this a uh, little while ago, I was sitting here praying, uh, preparing, and uh, I looked over, and uh, there's a, a box full of marbles here. And uh, I'm not saying have you lost your marbles, but but these marbles, uh, I don't know if you ever watched um, how it's made. But uh, that's an awesome show, isn't it? Uh, it? Teaches you how a lot of things are made. But these marbles, at one time, they were just uh, just glass and all these all these resins and colors laying around, and and how they molded them into these marbles and uh, these these uh, different colors and uh, in all these marbles and how they all have different colors, but all the same shape. Um, and how God created us in heaven and, and blended us together with different gifts, different talents, uh, different uh, callings, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we all uh, uh, do things differently. We see things differently. But we're all, and we're all shaped the same in Christ. Amen. We all have different 
physical bodily shapes, amen? But in Christ, we all look the same, just like these, this box of marbles, amen? They're all the same, but they all have a purpose, amen? And we in Christ are all the same. When God looks down at us, he sees, he sees us as, 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 as he would look at his own son, amen? He sees us in Christ, and we're all shaped the same in Christ. Because we are all forgiven, we're all blessed, we're all called, we're all chosen, we're all loved the same way. Amen? It's not like what God was saying, well, I like that guy better than I like this guy. You know what? God, believe it or not, this is hard to, to wrap your mind around. There's a lot of things I don't wrap my mind around. But, but God loves everybody equally and the same. Let, let me tell you, he loves the sinner the same as he loves you and I as saints. That, that's, that's something to uh, ponder on, isn't it? That God loves the sinner because he sent Jesus, didn't he? To die, not for the saved, but for the unsaved. He loves them. He loved us before we... The, the Bible says um, that he, he died for the, for the sinner while we were still in sin, Christ died for us. It says in Romans chapter 5. Amen. So Jesus, God looked down through eternity and saw us as, as being in sin. Amen. Romans chapter 5. And then he said, I need to send uh, a redeemer. Amen. A redeemer to redeem them from their sins. And as we accept Christ, you know, we think, well, now God loves me more than anybody else. No, God loves us the exact same way as he loves somebody that's not saved. Isn't that interesting? How great and awesome God's love is. And one day, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Amen? Are you anxious to see the king? Are you anticipating uh, Jesus breaking through that eastern sky? You know, a lot of times I'll stand out in my, on my back porch which faces the east, and I'll say uh, yeah, out loud because I can. There's nobody else around except for the cows, and they look at me a little strange sometimes. But uh, uh, I'll say, I'll look at the, the sun coming up or whatever and say, God, this will be a great time as I'm looking to the eastern sky that Jesus would break through. And, and at the shout of, of the angels and the, and the trumpet blast that, that we're going to be gone. I preach myself happy already, and we could stop right now, couldn't we? Because because we can look forward to a glorious reunion in heaven with all our loved ones that went before uh, to fall at Jesus' feet and in person thank Him for what He's done for us. Amen. So anyhow, where where was I? What was I preaching on? Oh yeah, yeah. We're going to continue in First Corinthians chapter two, and we're going to look at why. Why some people uh, don't receive from the Spirit of God? Why do some people seem like they such, have such a hard time? Or, or we're going to look at a couple things, and I'm not going to drag this out tonight and, and go extra long, but just look at three things. Can we just look at three things in your Bible tonight real quick? Because Paul talks about us in three ways. That's us as a man, women, men, men. Um, if you have your Bibles up to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to read uh, verses, and I mentioned this last week, we're going to read verses 14 in 1 Corinthians 2 through uh, chapter 3, 1 through 4. Uh, can we do that together? Uh, let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. 
For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Are you not acting like the world or mere men? So let's, let's take a look at this. Let's break this down uh, just real quick uh, tonight on a Thursday night. What does, what's Paul talking about here? Why is he calling some people carnal, some people natural men, and some people he says you're spiritual? So let, let's take a, a couple minutes and see if we can identify maybe with a couple of these things or maybe uh, because we really need to uh, in our lives, in our Christian walk, we need to sometimes take a step back or when we read the word, we need to ask ourselves, God, am I, am I acting like this? Is, is, have I come to a place in my, in my walk that, that I have slipped? We all do it. Amen. We're no, nobody's perfect. Um, but where am I? You know, we, we need to take a look sometimes in our Christian life. Uh, but where am I? So we, we reread these things, and, and the, the Apostle Paul says in verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of God. What, what does he mean by the natural man? I know there's a lot of different versions out there, and your version might explain this a little bit better. Um, I know the Passion reads real well here, but, but uh, the, the, basically the natural man is the unsaved man. Uh, is not redeemed. Uh, no clue uh, to what we're talking about, really. Uh, you know what it reminded me of? Remember the governor of Minnesota? Who is he? Who was he? Jesse the Body Ventura, the ex-wrestler, uh, 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 Worldwide Wrestling Federation champion. Remember him, Jesse the Body Ventura? Uh, my good friend and I, uh, uh, Mike Strevick, were in Baltimore one night to uh, to one of those. It was packed, and, and Jesse was wrestling. And... Um, I believe, uh, Mike, maybe you can, if you're on tonight, uh, I believe he was wrestling Ivan Putski. Remember Ivan Putski? Uh, here I go back sliding there into the past. And But uh, this Jesse, the body Ventura, he said uh, Christianity is for weak people, for weak-minded people. And, uh, boy, he just blasted Christians. Oh, man, it was, it was actually funny to listen to him blast Christians. You weak Christians, you know, that's because you're not strong and this and that. But he was a, a, a natural-minded man. He was his mind was on things of the world and not on things of God. Remember, um, um, it was in Matthew. I can't come up with a chapter where where um, uh, Peter said, uh, "Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere, and you know, I'll die for you." And and Jesus looked at Peter. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. And see, the, the natural mind isn't mindful of the things of God, but the things of man, things of this world. They're not mindful of the things of God. They're relying more on the world for their answers instead of spiritual truths that the Bible tries to teach us, that we can walk in and go by. Amen. Uh, the, uh, they, the, the natural-minded man may even attend church. Amen. I attended church uh, before I got saved. I had a Margie and I had a great spot on the back row of the church that we attended, and you know I had a great nap uh, for a little bit uh, in those in those services before I got born again. But uh, see, the natural man um, is even attends church, but not willing. To surrender, surrender their lives to Christ, because they're so so attuned to the things of the world, so patterned. In that, what Romans twelve two talks about, we're patterned after the things of the world. That's why we have to renew our mind, uh, uh, so we're transformed. Amen. Our lives are transformed, but uh, uh, but the natural man is the unsaved man. I don't want to dwell on this a lot, but but uh, there, there's a key in, in the Bible that tells us about this and how we can pray for the unsaved natural man. And that is in, you don't have to go there. If you want to, you can. But it's in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And I tell people this when they, they ask me, how can I pray 
for my family? How can I pray for my unsaved loved ones? Because we all have them, don't we? We all have loved ones that that uh, we we maybe sense they aren't saved, or or we know for a fact because of their lifestyle or their their words or whatever that they're not saved. But in Second Corinthians four four, listen to what it says. But it says verse three. It says, but even if our gospel is veiled, a veil is something we put over, you know, sometimes over our face or whatever, so we can't see. It's veiled to those who are perishing or the unsaved. Verse 4 says, whose minds, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Now, who's the God of this age? He's Satan, isn't he? Satan has blinded the minds of people that are unsaved, um, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So here's a key how we can pray and who these unsaved people are. They're those that, that Satan has, has, has put a veil over their eyes. And even though everybody has a, a free will and a choice to, to accept Christ or not accept Christ, amen, Satan does his best, doesn't he, to to uh, deceive us, deceive the unsaved people. I know I was deceived. You know, I, I didn't think I needed this this God stuff, this Christianity stuff. I was having a great, I was a good sinner. Amen? Anybody else can, I know you're just sitting there shaking your head. I was a good sinner. Amen? I was having a great time sinning. Amen? But Jesus, amen, but Jesus grabbed my heart. One after Sunday afternoon in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I gave my life to Christ. But see how as soon as I did that, as soon as I did that, as soon as you did that, the veil was taken away. And the glory to the say the, the, the glorious um, the glory of Christ shined upon us. The moment you got saved. We were transferred, Amen. Colossians one thirteen. We were we were transferred from the the, the power of, of Satan into the kingdom of, of, of Christ, Amen. So that's the, we were this and now we are that. But see, if the unnatural, the natural man, the the natural mind is not not focused or or even thinking about the things of God. Read read, read Romans chapter eight. It talks about our thought life and, and uh, how, what we think about and how important it is to think on the, on the correct things. But uh, the Bible, Paul says the natural man. So that's the natural man real quick. Uh, but Paul mentions two other men. Uh, he mentions the carnal man. And I'm going to take just a little bit of time to talk about this carnal man. Um, and it's in verse, uh, look at verses 1 through 4. If you want to just glance, he talks about uh, the carnal man and and, and verses three and four and um, uh, not not to make anybody mad out there tonight and because I deal with some things in in my life and in my mind um, that uh, Satan throws these fiery darts and you know that, that it gets me off track sometimes and um, that's why we have to keep our mind stayed on Christ our focused amen Hebrews twelve one and two on, on Christ. Uh, it sounds like these carnal people are Christians, doesn't it? So what is a carnal Christian? What is a carnal Christian, you might be asking. Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. Because in verse 1, it says, I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual people. So here he differentiates the difference. Uh, spiritual people, but as to carnal. As to what? Babes in Christ. So... Paul is saying, look, he wanted to impart something, I believe, deep and spiritual into their lives, but he couldn't because they were just carnal. Uh, real quick, I, I was reading this in, uh, in chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. It says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him. In all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. The testimony of Christ was confirmed in them. Uh, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting 
for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so here was a church, and we looked at this in men's Bible study a while ago, who was the church of Corinth was a was a was a powerful church. They they moved in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and just just a powerful church. But the Apostle Paul had to come in and write these letters to the church of Corinth and just correct them. I believe there was ten things that that he had to correct and and give them advice on and um, because you know it's like I said we we all amen we all deal with with um, with things are. are our carnal nature at times, and and the, obviously these people did too. Um, but uh, um, Paul and uh, uh, sort of, if you want to look at, it, he kicks him in the butt, doesn't he? You know, if, if uh, a lot of people you do that in church uh, spiritually, uh, and then they get mad at you, and they uh, they want to talk about you, and not that it's NAU people. I know better than that people in our church, but. Uh, but uh, the, the Apostle Paul uh, calls them uh, carnal Christians. And, uh, you know, um, he calls them babes in Christ. And I was looking at another scripture. Uh, are you, do you have your finger in Hebrews chapter 5? Uh, look at it real quick with me. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. If you want to look there, just follow along. You know, it's up to you. But uh, to me, it's... it's it sticks in my mind if I read it uh, four, five, six, seven, eight times. Sometimes I have to read it before it actually sinks in. Uh, for though by this time, verse 12, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. See, he was looking at them as, as spiritual people, but then he really... He really kicks him in the butt, doesn't he? Here, he says, "And and you have come to need milk and not solid food." In other words, maybe they were slipping back in some areas of their walk in Christ. Uh, maybe they were uh, doing things that that weren't really biblical, or you know, talking the wrong way, or you know what I mean, how things slip out. But uh. Verse 13 says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. The New King James Version says, For he is a babe. Ouch. So he's calling them the same thing. He, he talked to uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying the same thing Paul did, that he couldn't impart things to them because they were acting like babies. Amen? Amen? Then that, that, can you see that? They, well, I couldn't talk to you as spiritual people. I, I had to, I had to give you milk like a, like a newborn baby, you know. And and uh, uh, so he talks to them as as carnal Christians. What's a carnal Christian? Uh, maybe a, a carnal Christian is somebody who has too many character flaws. You know, the Bible talks about that, um, about the character of Christ and how our our lives are supposed to. Um, emulate the characteristics of Christ. That's what the character of Christ is in our lives. Amen? It's the character characteristics of Christ. Um, maybe they lacked spiritual growth. So he said, you know, you're, you're babes. You're still, you're still at this level. You know, I can't teach you everything you want to know because you're still acting like you're, like you're babies. You know, and I, I'm not saying I know grown-up spiritual Christians that act like babies. I would never say that. Well, I'd better leave that alone. Amen. But um, it, it sounds like, to me, to, to continue on before I get myself in trouble, um, it sounds like their church people, he's talking to the whole church, doesn't he? The whole church at Corinth. Uh, the spiritual truth didn't seem to guide their lives. You know, that's another thing about being a babe in Christ, that the spiritual truths, you know, I know it took me years and years before I finally realized, oh, these things I'm supposed to walk in, I'm supposed to know. But sometimes it takes a long time, doesn't it, to actually grasp a hold of them and, and really walk in them. But the, the Apostle Paul says in verse 3 that they were behaving like mere men. Ouch! They were behaving like mere men, not like like spiritual men, like Christians maybe are supposed to act, supposed to talk, 
supposed to walk. Amen. So a carnal Christian, you know, might be born again, or is born again, I believe, a carnal Christian, is born again, may know enough about God to know not to sin, but not committed enough to stay out of sin. Can I say that again? A carnal Christian may know enough about God to know not to sin, but not committed enough to stay out of sin. See, there's there's too many buts in their life. Amen. Yeah, but you don't know. But God, uh, but but and they, they don't they don't they don't get their own butts out of their long lives. Amen. Sometimes they walk backwards. Uh, well, I better stay out of that realm. But they, there's too much compromise in their lives amen too many excuses too much compromise amen instead of instead of taking a stand and not give in to the temptation of compromise they better just not strong enough in christ that's a carnal christian amen i know that listen we all go through stuff we all we're all tempted amen there's times that we all give in to that temptation there really is but thank god Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for his blood still being wet on the mercy seat. Amen. First John 1, 7, or is it 9? If we uh, ask for forgiveness, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So if, you're, if you've slipped tonight out there, if you something in your life that just isn't right, amen, God's there uh, with his blood ready to forgive you. The blood of Christ will forgive you and cleanse you and set you on the right path. Amen. That's good news. Um, uh, according to verse 3 and 4, continue on to carnal man. Uh, according to verse 3 and 4, a carnal man wants to identify with people of influence to make them look good. And it, what it does, it causes divisions, not only in other people's lives, but in our lives as well. When we... When we um, uh, we, we take man's opinion above God's opinion. When we take man's view instead of God's view on situations and, and everything else. That's why it's so important, so important to know what God's word says. So when things come up, because things are going to come up, amen, sometimes every day, that we have to make a decision about. Because this whole life is a decision. We have to, have to decide to believe God and his word. Or believe man in his word. You know, the, James talks about being a double-minded. Being a double-minded man. James chapter 1. And the Bible says that that, uh, that that man will receive nothing from God. Hey, That's a powerful, powerful convicting verse, isn't it? James chapter 1 is around verse 7. Something like that. Verse 6. Maybe somebody can look that up and put it on the screen somewhere. But, but uh, you know, the... the a carnal Christian is looking for man's opinion, man's approval. Amen. Even, even not only the worldly man, but even Christians, they're looking for Christians' approval. Well, if I if I look this way, if I dress this way, if I talk this way, if I agree with everything that person says, then I'll then they'll like me or I'll be in with them. And that's seems like that's what we want. And you know, the only person we really have to impress and be Get their approval is, is God. Amen. God's the only one that really matters in this world, in this life. Amen. The, what bothers me about carnal Christians, and I'm just going to be honest here for a minute. What bothers me about carnal Christians is they give Christianity a black, black eye. They really do. Because they, they might you know, do something, say something, or whatever. You know, and, and uh, people say, wow, if Christians can act like that, can do all that stuff, you know, maybe it's not so bad because I'll be able to do everything that I'm doing now. When the Bible says that to come out from among you and be ye separate, the Bible says. So really, we're supposed to be separatists, aren't we? We really are. But uh, they, they cause division. Their actions, their language, their relationships, amen, cause people to, to not see the true character of Christ coming through their lives. So, so carnal Christians, you know, the characteristics of Christ uh, don't come through us, don't come through them. And that's why we have to be so in, so in tune 
with the things of the Spirit, don't we? We really have to be so in tune with the things of the Spirit. Uh, so we, we can see things and know they're right or they're wrong and make a, 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 a godly decision how we're going to act and react and respond uh, to things of the world. So carn he calls them carnal Christians, and believe me, there is so much more, and I'm sure you know you can fill in your own blanks, and and I can too. Believe me, <laughs> believe me, I can too. Um, week after week, you know, we got to really um, check ourselves. We got to have a self checkup, don't we? So then Paul talks about the spiritual man. Let's talk a couple minutes about the spiritual man. Um, what does he mean? Uh, about the spiritual man, he talks about that. He mentions that uh, the church of Corinth was a was a spiritual church, uh, but they just needed some guidance, just like you and I, Amen. They just needed some guidance and correction, and that we all need correction. I know a lot of people don't like to be corrected, Amen. Who do you think you are telling me that? Well, I'm nobody, but what the Bible says, Amen. We're always to be corrected by the by the word of God, amen? Not by man's opinion or what we think should be how you should act or react or whatever or walk, but what does the Bible say, amen? What, what's, what's God's opinion in our life? That's the only thing that really matters, amen? Um, so he was calling, really, if you look at it, he was calling the whole church carnal, wasn't he? He really was. Uh, but we all have these these carnality traits in our life but let's look at the spiritual man what does what Paul gives us some hints right here in these verses as to what a spiritual person looks like and let's look at verse 13 real quick um, it says these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual See, too many times we want to compare spiritual things with the word, with the ways of the world, but but really we we need to stick with the spiritual, and and this, he says the Holy Spirit. So number one, number number one, a, a spiritual person is teachable. It doesn't matter how long you've been in Christ. It doesn't matter where you are. You know, level wise, wherever you're a bishop, apostle, whatever. You know, we all need to be corrected. We all need to be teachable. Amen. None of us have, have arrived. We'll never arrive till we get to heaven. Then we will have arrived to where we're supposed to be. Amen. Our home is in heaven. But uh, number one, the, a spiritual person is teachable. A spiritual person is, is correctable. Amen. You try to correct somebody, tell them, well, you know what? That's not really what the, what the Bible says. You know, and sometimes you see the uh, the old man, the old nature coming out in somebody that you know they throw their shoulders back and you know and, uh, try to be nice. But but anyhow, the, the spiritual person to me is a teachable person. A spiritual person is a humble person. Amen. A spiritual person will take correction and teaching with a spirit of humility, knowing that man, I really don't know everything. Amen. So that's a, a spiritual person. He's he's a discerner. You know, the spiritual person is a discerner. Isn't that what verse 14 says? It says, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, I, about three or four months ago, I talked about spiritual discernment and uh, how important it is to, to, to discern, not only to have wisdom in this life, but to, to discern um, uh, good and evil, right and wrong. Now, it's not so much as discerning right and wrong because it doesn't take a spiritual per person to discern what is right and wrong. You know, a natural mind knows what is right and wrong. Amen. But somebody that's spiritually discerning, and, and if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the, spirit, the, the, the gift of discernment. You know, it, it looks past. You know, what is a, what is a spiritual discerner? The spiritual discerner looks past what he sees in the natural and listens or compares that to what the Bible says is truth. You know, it's 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 so, it's, it's so much deeper than that. But but uh, uh, a spiritual person 
uh, is supposed to discern spiritual truths. And um, if, if go back real quick to uh, Hebrews chapter 5. I'm just going to read it real quick, if that's okay. It says, but solid food, verse 13 says, for he is a babe, but it says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age or are mature, your version might say. That is, those who by reason of use or, or by practice have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Because, you know, we, not everything in the world is good. It might look good, but, um, but uh, we read a book in men's Bible study, uh, it was last year, it was, it was uh, by John Bevere, it was called uh, Good or God. And it really opened our eyes to the things uh, that in the world that look good, but actually aren't from God. So a spiritual person is a discerner of the good and evil in this world. And even the things that look good, they discern, they look past what it might look and feel and smell and taste like. You know, like my grandson Cole uh, last week, he just thought I had to taste broccoli, uh, uh, Leslie. Uh, he just thought I had to taste, they love broccoli. Cole and Seth love broccoli. And they know that Paul does not like broccoli. And uh, so Cole, he looks at me, he laughs, he says, Paul, eat it. And he sticks it right up to my lips. Now I know, I know I don't like broccoli. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you coat it with. You can coat it with chocolate and it's not going to taste good. But he stuck that, so I, Paul opened his mouth, he stuck it in, and he laughed because the look on my face was probably priceless. But see, I had already discerned that broccoli was not good. But Cole got a kick out of it, so I did it for him. But see, we everything in this world that, that looks good is not good. We have to discern between good and God. Okay, so let, let's move along. So it's a spiritual discern. That's what fifth, verse 15 is all about. Verse 15, um, it says, For he who is spiritual judges all things. Which is, which is another bone of contention in, in, the, in, in Christianity, in the church world. Now, we, we think we can, uh, who are you to judge me? Well, I'm nobody to judge you. You have a righteous judge that, by the way, someday you're going to stand before. And I am too. I'm going to stand before the righteous judge. But it says, but it says the, uh, he who is spiritual judges all things. So we, 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 you say, well, we're not supposed to judge. No, we're not supposed to judge other people. But we have to judge things that are right and wrong. Don't we? we have to judge the things uh, of truth and error. We really do. Whether what, what mask you want to put on that, what wordage you want to put on that, we're, we're to judge right and wrong, truth and error. But we're not to called to judge other people. Amen? We're not called to judge other people. Their, their motives or whatever. You know, uh, we're, we're just not uh, to the point of, of condemnation. You know, we're, God's going to judge them someday. If that's the way they want to act, if that's the way they want to think or talk or act or whatever, you know, God's going to judge them. God's got to deal with them. It's not my point and my place to deal with people. It's just them to teach them the truth. So we have a righteous judge, amen, that someday, soon and very soon, we're going to stand before. Amen. Verse 16 says that we have the mind of Christ. You know, Dr. Wood, that was one of his favorite things. He has to always confess, had to always confess to himself that he had the mind of Christ. Um, and if you have the amplified or the passion, you know, it says it differently. But to have the mind of Christ is to have, hold on to, and follow his heart and thoughts. To have the mind of Christ is to have the thoughts that Christ had. The Bible says in is it Colossians chapter 2, to be mindful of things that are above, to be mindful of the things of Christ. Amen. That's what the mind of Christ is. The mind of Christ is to always be, always be thinking well, of what Jesus is thinking. Of, of, uh, not that we're sp big spiritual intellects. 
but we're just people that that of that want to know what God knows. Want to we want to know what Jesus knows and what Jesus is thinking. So we have to really I have to do that to confess that that I have the mind of Christ, that my mind is being renewed in the Word of God. Amen. That I am mindful of the things that are above and not so much on the things of this earth. Amen. Because if we get too mindful, especially the last couple of months, if we get too mindful of the things of here on the earth, you know, it can sort of uh, drown out or put a fog over um, uh, the things that of truth and things that are of God, and we become fearful. We become um, maybe doubting sometimes because we doubt. Well, what's, why isn't God doing anything? Why isn't, why isn't this gone? And, you know, the whole thing we can, but our trust, that's why I was talking to a brother in Haiti the other day, and uh, he was asking me some things about uh, how, did, how do we deal with it? How do I deal with it? You know, and, and uh, we talk back and forth, and, and we really do need the mind of Christ to deal with this whole thing. You know, I gave him to, to confess Psalm 91. I said, I said, Brother Feldes, put your name in there. Put your name in Psalm 91 and make it personal to you. See, that's the mind of Christ. To have the mind of Christ is to have the mind of the Word in, in our mind and in our hearts and in our motives and in the passions of everything we do. Uh, we're to feel what He feels. We're to, to think what He thinks. We're, and we're to, He wants us to know what He knows. See, what somebody said years ago, he said, he wants to keep us in the loop. You know, he doesn't want us to keep us in the dark. That's why, that's why we spent um, last uh, Sunday morning in five verses, in verses 9 through 13, because it's so important. That's the mind of Christ. The Spirit of God has the mind of Christ. It searches all things. Romans chapter 8. Amen. We're going to look at that next week, Romans chapter 8, if you want to pre-read a little bit in Romans chapter 8, or read the whole thing, amen, a couple times, three times. Uh, uh, without the mind of Christ, we cannot walk out His perfect will. Amen. Without the mind of Christ, we cannot walk out His perfect will and purposes on this earth. So we have to be, we have to mature in the things of God. We have to be a spiritual people uh, because we can very, very, very easily slip into the realm of carnality. Isn't that what Jesse Duplantis, um, uh, one of his, I can't remember the name, maybe some of out there, but he says that he had a fit of carnality. And how many of us at times have a fit of carnality and we have to catch ourselves before uh, it goes any further? So we have to have the mind of Christ. We have to be spiritual people. We cannot portray Christ to a lost and dying world and show forth the love of Christ and be imitators of God if we're going to be carnal Christians. So I want to challenge you tonight. Where are you at? Where are you at in your spiritual life? Where are you at in your spiritual walk? We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be Christ-minded. We're supposed to be walking this, this, this planet, this earth, you know, as new creations in Christ, as ones that are raised to new life in Christ. Are you walking that way? Are you talking that way? Are you thinking that way? Are you acting that way? Are you portraying Christ as the most important thing of your life? I pray that you are tonight. And um, if you aren't, uh, go to God. Just ask for forgiveness. First John 1 says he's, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So tonight, be in Christ, be hopeful, be faithful, and walk in this new life in Christ. Amen. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Pastor Rob will be here tomorrow night, and I'll be back Sunday morning to wrap up this series of raised to new life in Christ and we're going to we're going to see the power that's supposed to move through our life as Christians in Christ amen have a great weekend and be blessed in the lord amen